we'll get started. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Ahrens. Um, thanks for bearing with me, I have a little bit of a cold today. I'll try not to blow out your ears with my cough. Um, I'm here talking about ZFS snapshots. Uh, I work at Delphix, uh, we do a lot of cool work uh, with ZFS software development. And um, in the past, uh, I worked for some microsystems. I uh, helped to create ZFS. Um, and um, way, way, way back in the day, uh, at the very beginning of ZFS, helped to design and implement ZFS snapshots. So, um, so we'll start with the very basics. What are snapshots? So you can take a snapshot of a file system, and it basically stores an old copy without actually having to copy everything of the data. So this is really useful um, if you make a mistake, like you delete some files accidentally, you need to get them back, you need to get them back from the snapshot. Um, it's, it's also useful for mal malware recovery, where somebody else deleted your files accidentally. Um, and also it's used uh, in conjunction with ZFS send and receive to do replication of data to other systems. Who's used, who has used ZFS snapshots here? I see like 90 plus percent, okay. I need this part where you review. Um, so how do you use snapshots? Well, there's a bunch of commands. You want to take a snapshot, you type ZFS snapshot, and then the name of the snapshot is identified by the pool name, and then the file system name, and then, at, and then the name of the snapshot. You take a whole bunch of snapshots at once with the dash R flag. Uh, you can destroy snapshots. You can, as I mentioned, use send and receive to send uh, incremental changes. So in this case, we're sending from the old snap here is the one that's already on the other system. We want to send the, the, the incremental differences between that one and new snap. And then you can like pipe that over SSH or some other um, network protocol to your other machine into ZFS receive. <coughs> Uh, and then you, you can find out information about snapshots with, uh, with ZFS get to get some properties on snapshots. So uh, I'll review for a lot of you, fo of you folks. How do you really use snapshots? I know you can type those things, but in practice, what we tend to do is like, okay, I know, that you, I know you can do that, but what I'm going to do is set it up so that you know, every hour I'm going to take a snapshot, and then um, I'll just have them there in case I need it. I know some time passes. And then you wonder where all your space went. Um, so this talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, where the space went and how you can figure that out. But you're going to have to bear with me uh, a little bit at the beginning because um, we need to understand like how the snapshots actually work under the hood uh, to, uh, I think, to, to fully appreciate how difficult it is to answer that question of <coughs> where all your space went. It went to your snapshots. But if you if you want more detail than that, you've got to understand some, some more stuff. So um, how, at the very high level, <coughs> ZFS uh, is a copy on write file system. That means that whenever we're, uh, whenever we're writing to disk, we're selecting a new previously unused place to write the data, uh, with the exception of the root block here. So if we want to change some data blocks, like say these two in the lower left, we don't overwrite where they already are. We allocate new places on disk, with, which is represented by the green blocks. And at this point, nothing is pointing to those green blocks, so you know, if we crash, we won't be able to find them. They, won't, they aren't really part of the, of the file system. Um, so we have to write the indirect block that points to those green blocks. So we allocate another new indirect block, and another new indirect block all the way up the tree. And then finally, we have this new, um, like the, the block frozen by the green and then the blue ones over here. We can overwrite the root block to point to that one, and then we've atomically switched over to the new state of the world. So this is, this is true kind of in general with ZFS and copy and write file systems, uh, even in the absence of snapshots. But it makes implementing snapshots really easy. Um, so if we want to create a snapshot, all we need to do is save the old root block here before we overwrite it with the new one and make sure that we don't like free any of these old blue blocks. <coughs> so as you can see at the top there, uh, essentially, we have two parallel trees that reference some of the same blocks, but some some unique blocks. So, like the the tree that's rooted at the green might be is like the new file system, but the one rooted at the blue block at the top represents the old snapshot. Um, there's a couple other things that we need to worry about with snapshots. So, we've taken the snapshot nice and easy because we because we're using copy on array. But um, when a block is removed, we have to figure out can we free that block. Um, if we didn't have any snapshots, then like when you delete a file, all the blocks are gone, right? The file system can uh, go find them and clean them up and then reuse those places on disk for something else. But if you have snapshots, we might not be able to do that. So uh, in ZFS, 
the way we do this is we every block we keep track of its birth time. The birth time is the time when we allocated and wrote that block. Um, and we store that in the indirect block that points to it. So in this example, like this orange block was written at time 37, and the block pointer that points to it says that it, it was written at time 37. So uh, whenever we're removing a block, we have this block pointer available to us. And we can figure out if any snapshots reference it by just checking, is this time that the block was written after the most recent snapshot? If so, then no snapshots reference it. But if it was before the most recent snapshot, then at least that most recent snapshot references it, so we can't free that block. Um, again, nice and easy since we have the right data structures. But when we delete a snapshot, how do we find the blocks to free? So we need to find all the blocks that are unique to this snapshot, the ones that are only referenced by this snapshot that I'm deleting, and not by any other snapshots or file systems, and we need to free those blocks. This is a little tricky. Um, but uh, So we're going to be talking about that for the next few minutes. It's tricky, but it's worth it, because other, the way that other file systems have done this it is really, really expensive and makes using snapshots in practice um, impractical for a large number of snapshots. So, as I mentioned, the goal of snapshot deletion, we want to find the unique blocks, the ones that are only referenced by this snapshot. And um, we'll look at a few different algorithms, uh, keeping in mind what the goal is here. So the optimal algorithm would, would run in time proportional to the number of blocks that we need to free. So in other words, like if we're deleting a snapshot and it's going to recover us like a terabyte of space, then um, it's okay that that takes longer than deleting a snapshot that takes, that's going to recover only a gigabyte of space. Um, but it shouldn't be uh, like two snapshots that are, if we're deleting two snapshots and they're both going to recover a terabyte of space, they should both take about the same amount of time to delete. And um, ideally, the number of blocks that we read from disk should be much, much less than the number of blocks that we need to free. Um, so one key thing in the way snapshots work that is going to really help us with this is that block lifetimes are contiguous. In other words, uh, there's no afterlife. After a, a block is killed, it, meaning it's no longer referenced by the file system, um, it, can no, it, can, it can't become part of the file system again later on. So uh, you, know, you write a file, it becomes part of, you take a snapshot, it's part of that snapshot, then you take some more snapshots, then you delete the file, then you take some more snapshots, and while the file existed, that's when its blocks are referenced, and before that, they aren't, and after that, they aren't either. So there's no way to like, bring it back to life later on. The key thing about this is that it means that the blocks that are unique to a given snapshot are the ones that aren't referenced by the previous or the next snapshots. We don't have to look any further into the past or future to figure it out. All right, so uh, the first way that we could delete snapshots, uh, I call the turtle algorithm. Uh, the way that you, that you could do this is traverse the tree of blocks, uh, check, it, check their birth times to see if they're um, referenced by the previous snapshot, just like we, uh, it's similar to what we talked about for figuring out if, um, when we can delete, if we can delete a block that's run by the file system. Um, and a cool thing about this is that uh, we don't have to examine children if they're not referenced by the previous snapshot either. So um, to take this example here, um, but uh, essentially, if we find a block that was an indirect block, that was created a long time ago, then we know that all of its children were also created a long time ago. So we know that we can't delete any of that stuff. And we can skip traversing down into that part of the tree. And then, uh, so that takes care of whether the previous snapshot <coughs> references the block. And then we have to figure out if the next snapshot references the block. So we can, uh, one way to do that is to just kind of look at the next snapshot and um, go to the kind of the same location in the tree, the same file the same offset in that file and see, oh, is this pointer the same one as the one that I have? If so, then I can't delete it. But if it's different, then I know that the next snapshot doesn't reference it and all the ones in the future don't reference it. So this, this takes advantage of another characteristic of snapshots, which is that if there's a block pointer at one place in the tree, then it'll always be at that place in the tree in the previous or next snapshots. Um, you can't like move around. You can't like move the block pointer from one file to another file. Um, so this uh, this works, which is good. It's correct. Um, 
But uh, the disadvantage is that um, it can take a long time. Uh, it takes time proportional to the number of blocks written since the previous snapshot. So those are the ones that we have to go check and see if they are uh, present in the next snapshot. And we might have to remove a lot of blocks. Like uh, each indirect block might be only pointing to one data block that we care about. And then we have to go read that and then we have to read the same corresponding indirect block in the next snapshot. So it might actually be like 2x the number of blocks that we're going to free. Um, so like the disadvantage is maybe like maybe you have to go read a million blocks, but you actually are freeing nothing. Um, it, this could happen really easily if the next snapshot is identical to this one. Um, and you might actually have to read two blocks from disk in order to just free one. Uh, so you're going to end up doing a lot of random reads. And this is a big problem because uh, it can actually become a bottleneck for being able to inject <coughs> new data into your file system because you can, in, if you imagine like a you know, single rotating disk, you can write out about 200 megabytes per second, but uh, you might only be able to free at less than one megabyte per second. So uh, once you fill it up once, you can really only write to it at one megabyte per second, even though um, you have a lot more uh, you know, capacity because you can't free stuff any faster than that. <coughs> All right, so uh, this algorithm, thankfully, was never implemented for ZFS. <laughs> um, so uh, let's talk about the next algorithm called the, uh, which I call the bunny algorithm, um, or maybe the hair algorithm. So the, the key thing here is that we're going to add an additional data structure called a dead list that, to keep track of blocks that are no longer referenced. Uh, this is an on-disk data structure. And every, every data set, meaning every snapshot and every file system has this dead list. It tells us, here are the blocks that um, were referenced by the previous snapshot, but they aren't referenced by this snapshot or file system. So it's the blocks that I killed. Um, so if we look at this diagram, uh, this is showing a timeline of snapshots. So snapshot one, two, three, and then the file system. Um, the, and then these are showing kind of lifetimes of blocks. So this red line is showing that blocks on snapshot two's dead list are the ones that are, they were referenced, they were alive during snapshot one. Maybe they were alive in, alive in earlier snapshots, maybe not. Um, and those are the ones on snapshot one's dead, dead sorry, on snapshot two's dead list. And then similarly, the green ones on the green ones dead list. So how does this help us? When we want to delete a snapshot, in this example, the, the red one, the target snapshot, uh, we can find the blocks that are referenced only by this one uh, by looking at the next snapshot's dead list. So that, that, those are these blue blocks. And uh, the blue blocks include kind of two types uh, from, from what we care about. The ones that were born between these two are the ones that are unique to this snapshot. So we, we just have to go through the list of all, all of this ones, go through this snapshot's dead list. They'll give us all the blocks. And we need to look at the birth times, which is stored in the block pointer in the dead list, and see, is it in this range? If so, it's this type. And so it's unique to this spot, this snapshot, and we can get rid of it. Otherwise, it's referenced by the previous snapshot, so we can't get rid of it. And then we combine the two dead lists. So let's, let's take a look at how well this works. Um, it takes time proportional to the size of the next snapshot's dead list, which is the number of blocks deleted before the next snapshot which is kind of similar to the previous algorithm, but the big advantage is here is that the dead list is compact. So every block of the dead list that we read in, it has 1,024 block pointers inside of it that we can go evaluate. So theoretically up to like 2,000 times faster than the previous algorithm, which is really good. But it can still take a long time to free nothing um, because you know, it might be that the dead list contains a lot of entries, but they're all this type of, of entries, ones that were born before the previous snapshot. <coughs> all right, so onto the cheat algorithm. Oh, so, uh, so this is actually what was implemented in ZFS uh, at the beginning. <coughs> and um, yeah, it can be slow to these snapshots. We implemented the cheat algorithm, um, I think, in around 2008 or nine. Um, so the, the, the shoot algorithm is, is based on the previous one. It's an extension of that. Um, and what we do is we divide the dead list into sublists based on the birth times. Because you remember, uh, when we, like, we delete snapshot four, we want to find these blocks. So the key thing here is, well, let's just kind of do that beforehand. 
um, as we're creating the fed lists, we're going to actually create several lists of blocks that are all part of Snapshot 5's dead list. But there's one list for blocks that were born in this range, one for blocks that were born in this range, one for this range, one for that range. So we can separate them out based on um, when the blocks were born, and the separations are based on what previous snapshots exist. So now, when we want to delete a snapshot, we need to iterate over the, the sublists and find the ones that whose where the sublist corresponds to this time range, so in this case it's just this one, we need to free everything that's on this sublist and keep all the stuff that's on these ones. So we need to uh, just merge these together and delete this one. So, uh, and then um, the, the next trick is that when we merge these lists together, uh, we can do it by reference. So we'll basically say, okay, we don't actually have to like iterate over this whole list and copy all the block winners over here. We just say this, this list, is like this list includes this other list by reference. So now, in terms of performance, when we delete it, uh, it's going to take time proportional to the number of sublists because we have to, you know, um, append them to the other ones, and and top proportional to the number of blocks to free, which is remember the goal. So um, in practice, uh, you can see this is going to give us much much better performance, um, 1,500 megabytes per second. Uh, with these assumptions compared to being able to write at about 200 megabytes per second. So finally, snapshot deletion is not your bottleneck. Um, Yay. Yay. <laughs> uh, and you know, typically the number of sublists sub is much less than the number of blocks to free, so we can sort, sort, of, sort of ignore that. We'll, we'll get back to that later. Um, but uh, you know, I didn't really tell you, where did all the space go? Like That's not very interesting. It's good to understand how snapshots work in deadlists because we're going to come back to that. Uh, but where did the space go? I know space is empty, but your storage space is usually not empty. <laughs> All right, so the first thing you might do um, if you want to know how much space your snapshots are using is type CFS list. And uh, you might see uh, that uh, our pool slash fs, the file system, is using 1,000 gigabytes, uh, but it's only referencing 700 gigabytes. So refer, uh, the refer or reference um, property means like how much actual data can I get to by looking at files in this file system. Um, and uh, in this case, like if you didn't have any snapshots, we didn't have anything fancy going on, then use and refer would be the same. Uh, but we do have fancy stuff going on because we have snapshots. So um, the first thing that you want to do is look at the used by snapshots property. So this is going to tell us how much space is used by all of the snapshots put together. In other words, how much space would be recovered if I deleted all of this file system's snapshots? In this case, it's 300 gigabytes. And 300 gigabytes plus the 700 gigabytes that's referenced equals the 1,000 gigabytes. That's great, but what if I um, want to know like which of my snap like which snapshots are using up that 300 gigabytes? So you have DFS list dash t all. It lists all your snapshots. It lists how much space they're using. Um, they say they're using you know one or two or three gigabytes. So um, all right, great. So I add up all the space used by the snapshots. That's seven gigabytes, uh, which is not 300 gigabytes. So like which is it? Seven gigabytes or 300 gigabytes? Where what about the other 293 gigabytes? All right, so here, here's the big, the big reveal. The snapshots used space is actually just the space that's unique to them. So in, uh, I'll explain why this is, but uh, I think that probably it was a mistake for us to display this information so prominently because it is so misleading. Um, you know, in ZFS uh, space accounting, Usually, the, the, the concept that we go back to is um, th like there's a lot of space sharing. So we have to have some principles of like who gets charged for some space. And usually, the, the idea is if I were to delete this thing, how much space would I get back? Uh, because it's very like direct and practical, right? So the, the snapshot's used space is how much space you would get back if you deleted that snapshot. Um, and, uh, and this is true. Um, 
And uh, so the snapshot's use space is the same as its unique space, because that's, remember, the space unique to that snapshot is what we get back if we delete a snapshot. But that's not very useful, because snapshots have shared space. So you can very easily have a situation like the one that we just diagrammed, where um, all of your snapshots have very little unique space because they're sharing it with their neighbor. You can imagine, like, if, if instead of taking a snapshot every hour, we just said every hour, take two snapshots right in a row. Then essentially you would always have zero space used by any one snapshot, but lots of space used by all of your snapshots together. Because those two snapshots that were taken right back to back are going to have almost the same contents. And so if you delete one of them, you get almost no space back. But if you deleted both of them, then you get a bunch of space back. So um, we come back to our snapshot timeline diagram. So here I'm showing not, not what's in dead lists, but just the lifetimes of various blocks, types of blocks. So the blocks that are counted in the used or unique space of the snapshots are the ones that are like this, unique to the one snapshot. So like snap twos, uh, unique or used space is just the blocks that were born after the previous snapshot and died before the next snapshot. But there's all this space that's shared between them. It can be shared between two, three, four, five, six, seven snapshots. Um, and then there's also space that's not used by snapshots, that's the, the 700 gigs, which is referenced, still referenced by the file system, and it might have been um, born at various points in time uh, <coughs> relative to the snapshots. All right, so this, ex this kind of explains why the default stuff that we're showing you is not very useful. <coughs> How can we do better? So here's another way of thinking about space used by snapshots which is to not think about space used by snapshots, <laughs> but instead to think about the ingestion rate of when data was added to your file system. And we can see that with the written property. So the written property tells, tells us how much space was written um, since the previous snapshot. Uh, and this applies to both file systems and snapshots. In this example, um, the file system and the most recent snapshot are identical, so there was no space written to the file system no data written to the file system since the most recent snapshot. But you can see um, here, it makes it more clear that, okay, well, most of the space was written before the first snapshot. So in other words, like, it seems like what happened was we populated the file system with a bunch of stuff, 894 gigs of stuff, then I took the first snapshot, and that was the bulk of my data. Then I wrote another 52 gigs of stuff, I took the next snapshot, snap two, then I wrote another 51 gigs of stuff, Took the next snapshot, that was snap three, and, and then three gigs before snap four, and then nothing before, uh, nothing after snap four. So the cool thing about this is that you can actually reason about the sums of this. So the sum of all the space written is equal to the file systems used, because the, the, the whole file system and all those snapshots is all the space that was written uh, through that whole timeline. So, you know, zero plus 894, all that added up together gives us 1,000 gigabytes which is the space used by the file system. Um, and another way to, to uh, remember, the other way we can break it down is that the file system's reference plus used by snapshots is the same under gigabytes. Um, but these are not, like, they're not talking, they're talking about the same, um, talking about space, but these are two different ways of looking at that space. And the written doesn't tell us directly, like, hey, if you delete these two snapshots, then you're going to get space back. But you might see the kind of patterns like I talked about before of like if you if you're creating these pairs of snapshots, then you would see that pattern in the space written where you see one snapshot written as a bunch and then zero and then a bunch and then zero and then a bunch and then zero. You see that kind of pattern uh, in there, and that that would help you to understand um, when space was added. That was there a question? Yeah, I'm just maybe I missed something here, but to me intuitively those written numbers should add up in total to 1,007 gigabytes, not 1,000 gigabytes. Oh, where's, where's so you said it's just unique, never mind, that's what it is. Okay. Yeah, so these are two, the it's written and not. the unique are like two different ways of looking at the space. Like, they don't, they aren't adding together or being the same thing. It's like a different conceptual model. And, and I think the key thing here is that the, the unique space is like, not a conceptual model that's going to help you to understand your space usage or like what action to take. 
versus the RIN can help you actually understand like what it may not it may not tell you directly like you should delete this set of seven snapshots to free up space, but it'll at least tell you something very real about the history of your file system. Um, so if we go back to this diagram, uh, where how do we figure out the written space? Well, um, I'm not going to tell you actually how we figured it out, but conceptually, um, conceptually, like the space that's written by snap one is the stuff that was born since the previous snapshot, which is down here. So it's the, all these timelines that start right here. So the yellow, the orange, and the purple added together. For the red, again, all of, all the timelines that block, blocks whose lifetime start in this range. So the red and the lighter purple there, and so on. Um, and all these may encompass some blocks that are still referenced by the file system, right? which is why we can have um, the space written by the first one is 894 gigs, which is way more than the space used by all the snapshots, um, because that most of that space is still referenced by the live file system. And the reference isn't changing, refer? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in this example, in this example, um, we're talking about, like, let's say, uh, a database or a virtual disk image, which is being overwritten, um, rather than like something that's just being added to and added to. So like the amount of space reference is the same, throughout this whole file system's history, um, but some blocks are being overwritten. Yeah. If, you're, if you're dealing with something more basic like data ingestion, where like you basically you're never freeing anything, then it's a lot easier to understand what's going on. Because like basically, you're going to um, sum up the written, and that's going to equal the used, and that's also going to equal the refer. Right? And, um, and also in that case, like deleting snapshots will never give you, like the used by snapshots is going to be close to zero. So, um, that's like not as interesting of a use case in terms of understanding. I mean, the the read and all that stuff uh, will help you to understand like when data was ingested, right? But um, if you're wondering like why, like your snapshots aren't using a lot of space, so you don't have the the, the question of why, or, like where did my space go? Okay. Um, so yeah, like, <clears throat> and this occurs for other workloads too, like. Um, you know, kind of like home directory kind of stuff where like you're creating and deleting a lot of files over time and maybe the total amount of space, like maybe you have a 700 gig quota on the space, so of course it's always 700 gigs, but you're creating and deleting files to stay at around that quota. Uh, okay, so there's another cool thing that you can do with the written space, uh, which is that there's these uh, additional properties that kind of appear on the fly, written at, and then the name of a previous snapshot. So you can say not just how much space was written since the previous snapshot, but how much space was written since some snapshot in the past that I am going to specify here. Um, and conceptually, the way this works is like, let's say I want to say, hey, snapshot three, how much of your space was written since snapshot one? I can get this property, written at snap one of snap three, um, and it's going to find the space whose birth times are after snap one and that are still referenced by snap three. So it includes. Um, the, you know, the, obviously this one and the light blue one, also this light purple one, but it, it doesn't include this space because that's not actually part of SNAP3, right? that, that, that was killed before SNAP3. Um, implementing this is uh, a little bit tricky, so I'm not, not going to go into too much detail there. Um, but this is, oh, the, the cool thing about this, um, in addition to being able to ask these kinds of questions, um, which might or may not occur to you which ones to ask. Um, the same underlying mechanism is used for ZFS send space estimation. So when you do like a ZFS send of an incremental, and you're saying like, hey, I want to send an incremental. The other side has snap one. I'm sending snap three, snap two. Like I, I don't care about some temporary snapshot or whatever. Um, you can say, you know, how much? Uh, essentially, the the amount of data that we're going to send is based on the snap three's written at snap one. Because we need to know how much space, like this, the other guy has snap one, how much space was written in snap three since snap one. So we do that and then just like meddle with it a little bit to take it into account like compression and headers and some other stuff. Okay, but uh, probably the reason most of you sorry, came to this talk I'm not talking to you, Siri. <coughs> is uh, to understand 
um, shared snapshot. Well, you came here to, to wonder, where did all my space go? Um, and my answer was, it's all shared. Don't worry about it. It's just, it's, it's shared between the snapshots. It's all cool. <laughs> um, OK, well, if you want some more detail than that, um, here's one way to understand it. So we can ask, we can do this what if. We can say, what if we were to delete some of the snapshots, not all the snapshots, which is the, which is the used by snapshots property, not just one of the snapshots, which is that snapshots used or unique property, but what if I deleted some of the snapshots? So you can ask this question with uh, ZFS destroy dash NV, and then a list of snapshots. And you can list that snapsh list the snapshots like with commas separating um, each of the snapshots' names. You can also list a range of snapshots with this like begin, percent, end. And then it means like if I were to delete begin, end, and all the snapshots in between. Um, how would you actually like put this into practice? So uh, what what we've done at Delphix is we categorized um, the snapshot space into different application defined classes. So for example, there's like some snapshots were created because you set this policy that said I want to create a snapshot every hour. And some snapshots were created because the user explicitly requested a snapshot. And some snapshots were created for one of those reasons. But then actually we wanted to delete it, but we couldn't because you created a clone of it or something else, or something like that. So we categorize the snapshots into these different categories, and then we can say, okay, um, I can at least tell you that like uh, the space used, do, you know, purely due to your retention policy of like creating snapshots every hour and, re and keeping them for a year is costing you X gigabytes, um, it, versus the space that's like used by your clones, which presumably like you want to keep those like you have a reason to keep those around anyways, and you're not going to be deleting them no matter what. We can tell you how much space that was, so you can tell like okay, if I were to change my retention policy, like what's the maximum that I'm going to be possible to get back? Um, so the the idea here would be that you would say like okay, this is destroy dash nv list all the snapshots in one class, and that'll tell you um, how much space you would get back. Like how much space that class of snapshots is using. But um, you still need to have some shared space between the different classes at the end of the day. Um, so there's definitely a caveat there, but this is better than uh, the other tools. Um, okay, so now, how could we implement this? So we've seen two corner cases already, which I mentioned, the, the, if you're asking about one snapshot or all the snapshots. But in the general case, um, in the general case, uh, we only really care about the, the first example where you're looking at a contiguous range. Um, if you're looking at several disjoint ranges, then you can just calculate each of them separately and then add them all up because, um, you know, because, because the, the, the lifetimes of blocks are contiguous. There's no afterlife. So um, it boils down to the question of like, what happens if I want to delete this contiguous range of snapshots? In this case, we're saying from begin to end, these five snapshots, I want to get rid of them. So we have to find all the space that is um, that is referenced by any of these five snapshots, but not any other snapshots. So we can think of it as like the space that's unique to this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, that's this line. The, the space that's and then plus the space that's shared by two, meaning like here's space that's shared by two, by two, by these two, these two, these two, the space that's shared by three, which is the next section, the space that's shared by four, and lastly the space that's shared by all five of the snapshots that we want to delete. Um, so if I arrange this a little bit differently, so this is the same same lines, but just sorted out differently, hopefully this harkens back to a diagram from earlier in the talk about deadlists. So uh, for example, the, uh, the, the blue lines there are all examples of sublists from the blue snapshots deadlist. Uh, and similarly, like you know, here are two sublists from Snap3's deadlist. Uh, now, of course, if there's earlier snapshots, Snap3 might have other sub deadlists that extend further back, but these are the ones that we care about. So we just need to find all these sublists and then add up the space that's in them. And then, awesome, like we've done this, uh, we've implemented, implemented this. Um, although, one little trick is that. Uh, there are O of n squared 
deadlifts with subjects. Uh, or over and square deadlifts that we need to add up. <coughs> um, and in this case, like, so what I, what I mean by that is that, um, so here there's five snapshots that we are asking about deleting. Um, and the number of sublists here is a proportional to five squared. It's about half of five squared. Um, so like this is, yeah, it's five, it's not too bad. Uh, but what if you have like a hundred um, snapshots in a row and you want to know how much space are those used by? Well, here's the thing. Uh, n squared is it gets really big, really, really, really fast. So this graph is only showing n up to 100. I don't know if you can see at the very, very bottom, there's a line showing uh, n, like uh, y equals x, x equals y, and another line showing like n log n. Um, they're like basically, you know, barely even above zero, and n squared is way, way, way up there. It goes so fast. So you know, if you're talking about 100, um, 100 snapshots, it's like a lot of deadlifts, but what if you're talking about those 8,700 snapshots? Then it's a lot, a lot, a lot more. So um, uh, it's hard to get like a real like visceral feel for how quickly n squared goes. Um, but if you have these 8,700 snapshots, which is remember one per uh, one per hour for a year, then you'll have 75 million lists. Well, I mean. Computers can do millions of things, right? Like, I mean, we have CPUs do like uh, billions of instructions per second or something. I mean, it's like no big deal. Um, but if you imagine like each list, let's imagine that each list is one sector. And the thing is, disks don't do millions of things per second. Um, they store lots of stuff, but imagine that each one of these lists just takes up one sector on disk, four kilobytes. You're talking about every file system taking an additional 200 and almost 300 uh, gigabytes just for this metadata about your snapshots, just for one, like one aspect of the metadata. And uh, if you want to ask this question of like, hey, what happens if I delete like most of these 8,700 snapshots, we're going to have to read in all these deadlifts. If you're, let's say your disks are super duper fast, you can do 10,000 IOPS, it's going to take you two hours to read them all in. Uh, don't try this on a spinning disk. <laughs> I didn't do the math on that, but it probably would overflow my calculator. Oh yeah, and um, you know the way, the way that we implemented this is pulling a bunch of locks that prevents uh, doing txg sync. So like uh, after a couple seconds, you're not going to be processing any more writes in your source code. <laughs> not great. Um, and this is this is a. Uh, this is how it works back in the day. Um, but people didn't have a lot of snapshots then. So, uh, but here's, here's the key thing. Nearly all these lists are empty. When you're talking about thousands of snapshots, um, it's, it's almost impossible to have all of them be actually in use and, and, and have, have all these sublists actually have a non-zero number of blocks in them. Because remember, we're breaking it down based on the birth time. So, like, you know, when there's a thousand snapshots back there, it's pretty unlikely that like the that the data that was deleted in this time range was written spread out over a thousand different um, you know snapshots in the past. Blocks tend to have more. Like, it tends to be more like, okay, I created this file. I wrote like a bajillion blocks here, and then I. Deleted that file, so I deleted the Brazilian box there. Uh, okay, cool. So, <clears throat> all right. So in 2012, I implemented this feature called Empty Bpouch. This is an on-disk feature, so there's a feature flag associated with it. You might have seen that. Um, to not store the empty sublists on disk. Um, with that, uh, we're able to prop to answer that question about how much space the, the 8,000 snapshots are using in about a minute uh, when, we're, when they're crashed in the yard. Um, the next, uh, so and plus, obviously, we get to save all that space, right? You don't have the 300 gigabytes of, of wasted space storing all your empty business. Um, the, the next change that we are making uh, is that we review up for now is partial deadless loading. So, this is, uh, so these are still 
like the algorithms are still O of n squared. You still have like uh, a table of all of those past times, but you can have big, big speed ups um, by being smarter about how we process it. So uh, basically, this uh, this change, partial deadlift load, is all about short circuiting early on when we discover, oh, like here's a this is uh, a deadlift. This is a sublist that is uh, empty. We're gonna like kind of shortcut our processing early on so that um, we save time. And that brings, gives us a 5x speed up. Um, so down to 12 seconds. Um, and this is, what, this is what we have been using at Delphix for several years. Um, and it works pretty well. Like uh, we haven't had any customer complaints since then. So about this. <laughs> um, so uh, that, there's a review out for that um, against the DFS on Linux. Um, and that's, that's a good speed up. Uh, the next thing that we want to do, uh, which I prototyped, is um, caching these partially loaded deadlifts. This gives us a huge extra win because most of the time is spent going in, uh, you know, you're still, like, there's still entries for all 75 million, um, all 75 million uh, sublists. And we have to go process them, but you know computers can do millions of things like pretty quickly as long as we're not asking them to do very much for each of those um, millions of things, um, which is kind of the case for the, the partial deadlift stuff. But the 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 cool thing about caching this partially loaded deadlift is that we get a huge extra speed up, 70x, uh, bringing this down to much less than a second. Um, and uh, prototype that it works pretty well. I mean, you still have the 12 second um, penalty the first time that you ask this question, but if we keep it cash, then you know you boot up, you pay this tax once, and then, uh, and then you're fine. All these cases are still O of n squared, but in uh, like with the partially death, partial deadless load, we're just um, making the constant factor smaller by certain many earlier, and then with the cache and the partially loaded deadless, um, we're, we're kind of cheating the n squared because we're saying like we're only gonna actually keep in memory and have to process the thing, the deadlifts that are populated. Um, so whether that's n squared or not kind of depends on the access pattern. Like if, if you if you assert that 1% um, of all of the sublists are are non-empty, then it's still like O of n squared. But if you assert that like, oh like at most a thousand of the sublists are non-empty, then it's actually like constant time. So uh, that really depends on the workload a lot. <coughs> okay. Cool. So, um, we'll have time for lots of questions. If you're con the takeaway, hopefully the takeaway from this talk is that if you're confused by snapshot usage, you're not alone. Um, but here are some tri here are uh, some tips that you can use. So first, look at the used by snapshots. That's going to tell you how much space is used by all the snapshots put together. Then ignore this. Ignore the snapshots use space. I know we put that right up in your face when you do ZFS list dash t all. Um, maybe we should consider just getting rid of that. But uh, ignore the snapshots use snapshots use space. The written space can help you understand how the space grew over time, and then you can do these what if kind of experiments uh, with the destroy dash mv list of snapshots. So uh, one final announcement before I take questions. Um, we, uh, OpenZFS organizes the a annual conference called the OpenZFS Development Summit. Um, we're going to have the seventh uh, annual conference this year, November 4th and 5th. Um, it's in San Francisco. Uh, talk proposals are due uh, August 19th, and uh, we still have several sponsorship opportunities available. So if your company is interested in being known as a uh, sponsor of OpenZFS and helping to continue uh, OpenZFS, uh, into the future, we have some new um, new uh, benefits in the sponsorship program this year. So uh, talk to me or send me an email. And with that, uh, I'll open up to questions. Oh, everybody understood what I said perfectly. Have <laughs> <laughs> you uploaded your slides yet? I've not uploaded my slides yet. I was just finishing them this morning. <laughs> but I will. <laughs> All right, well, feel free to come chat with me afterwards. And, uh, and if you're interested in ZFS,
come to Alan Jude's talk. Uh, to, I think it's right, right, right after lunch. No. Is that right? Uh, no. Come to the bar. Yeah, come, come to the bar. Yeah, first come to the bar at lunch, and then come to Alan Jude's talk, where, where he will be talking about um, kind of an overview of ZFS and FreeBSD, OpenZFS, FreeBSD, ZFS on Linux, how they're all related, how we're all going to get along in the future. <laughs> 245. 245. All right. Well, speaking of getting along, why did you pick a name that the Canadians and Americans have to pronounce differently? I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were there were not a lot of letters left, <laughs> and that was 20 years ago almost. We, we could just make a canonical pronunciation opens. <laughs> <laughs> we both pronounce that the same. <laughs> I think we'll start with. Cool. Thank you, everyone.